Welcome back, class. So like we mentioned in the previous unit, clearly there's a strong connection between physical activity and health. We know the benefits are, are substantial, even with a smaller investment at lower levels, right? Um, so what, what's, what's preventing people from being more active? What's, what's the cause here, right? So just a little bit of insight. Since the publication of the first, um, the first edition of the Physical Activity Guidelines for American back in 2008, um, you know, the percentage of adults, again, who've participated in aerobic exercise and strength training has improved, right? We've seen some improvement, right? From 18%, 22 points percent for um, combined aerobic and strength. So again, we're about 70 to 80, 75 to 80% who don't, right? But we, we made an improvement. And aerobic exercise, again, improved from about 43% to about 53%. Um, again, these, these numbers will always slightly vary depending on the, uh, the sample. That's why I might see 52.5, 53.3. They're about a percentage or so. So um, again, we've had major campaigns. We have a second edition out now, which you guys can see here, uh, which came out very recently. And we've had multitudes of national campaigns, the exercises medicine campaign. However, you know, despite these increases, despite our efforts, Physical activity prevalence remains low, right? Especially in certain groups, right? In rural subgroups, um, we see a higher higher prevalence of inactivity. In certain urban groups, we see higher levels of inactivity, right? So, um, just as, a, as a, some statistics here, since 2008, the prevalence of meeting physical activity guidelines have risen from 19.4 percent to 25 percent amongst urban residents, and from 13 percent to 19 percent amongst uh, rural residents, right? So again, we're, we're still seeing major disparities in, in certain uh, groups here. So you know, people may ask, well, what is going on here? Right? What, what is contributing to this, right? And what could we do to potentially improve these rates? Because again, even with these improvements, the vast majority of people are still not meeting those guidelines. So the question is then, or well, the healthcare providers, right? It's a, it's a perfect target most people have um, a clinic, and there's data support from the CDC. The vast majority of people have access to a clinic that they routinely get health care from in an outpatient setting. Um, so health care providers have been a key target for individuals uh, to recommend or to receive recommendations from about physical activity. So um, the number of health care providers that actually recommend physical activity has, in, has increased, right, about, by about 40%. So we're finding that about a third of healthcare providers do this, which is, which is better than it had been. And importantly, the vast majority of healthcare providers agree that it's important. There's a systematic review by um, Herbert uh, Haber et al. Uh, they reported about across the literature 61 to 99 percent, again, multiple studies, systematic review, either agree or strongly agree that physical activity should be promoted in the in you know in primary care. And the majority report that it's a it's a major part of their responsibility. Um, we're also finding that physical activity recommendations do appear to be similar across different ethnic groups and sex gender, which is which is good. Um, older adults are more likely to receive recommendations than younger adults. Um, and individuals who report themselves as inactive are more likely to receive recommendations than those who report being active. Um, so really, we're seeing, um, you know, as well, individuals with chronic diseases are have the highest likelihood, a fivefold more likely, higher likelihood of receiving some sort of physical activity, promotion, or counseling, or guidance from their healthcare provider. So while the overall frequency of physical activity recommendations is inadequate, right, across the population, because, you know, while we've made a 40% improvement since 2000, it's still, you know, two-thirds of people don't receive these counseling. But at least it appears that we're getting it, or at least attempting to distribute it equitably, um, and particularly to people of the greatest perceived need, right? So individuals with chronic disease, older individuals, um, and individuals who say, I'm inactive. Now, there may be a lot of factors at play here for, for healthcare providers. 
busyness of clinics and other things there. But I really want to unpack this, right? So how, how did we get here? How did we get to this point where physical activity, you know, is, is a major problem? Um, you know, it's been one for a long time. So, you know, what, what got us to that point and how is it still a major problem given what, all that we've known now, really especially over the past 20 years between this association, right? So as we stated previously, there's only been a modest increase in the number of individual, individuals participating in physical activity across the population since many of these initiatives have began, not, you know, for some of them over 20 years ago. Um, and the majority of people still aren't really encouraged to increase their physical activity levels either by their healthcare providers. So some pretty key barriers are, you know, this is a great paper by Egan, which looks at more in obese patients with type 2 diabetes, um, but barriers being, you know, discomfort, exercise is too boring, no time, too tired, the weather, we'll unpack some of these things more um, in, in more detail. But it's not, you know, while we know the value, right, you know, for someone who's inactive, we're making a behavior change, right? And there's things that go into that. We talked about the social cognitive theory. We talked about the theory of, of um, planned behavior. These things all play a role here in, in this behavior of, of activity as well. So we, we, we realize that, um, you know, a lot of our efforts probably should be in just getting people to start and enhancing the, the experiences pertaining or regarding exercise, making it something that people want to come back to doing. However, there are other things to consider here, right? Even if people understand that it's, you know, or even if people are, um, even if people are getting recommendations, um, they may not be able to necessarily implement them, right? So some people may not have access and a large number of people don't even know the guidelines, right? So some status, some reports report that about 25% of adults um, even know them, right? So like we're, 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 we have all these initiatives out there to improve, you know, participation. And like, wow, the vast majority of people don't even know the guidelines. Like what do they need to get to? Um, and because of that, like just giving a generic recommendation might not work. Right, like, and we'll, you know, we'll, we talked about health literacy and how that affects things too, but that's probably playing a major role here. And even if people are given the guidelines, are given the recommendations, right? Do they have the requisite knowledge to be able to appropriately set goals, progress, and sustain long-term participation? Right, getting people started is important. However, so is long-term participation, long-term behavior change. And again, we're fighting potentially some major inertia from other factors I don't think people think about often. So again, social determinants of health, right? Like these are things that we, we talked about with other conditions, it affects activity as well. Um, so probably one of the biggest ones, income, you know, income, income and socioeconomic status. The percentage of adults from the highest income brackets um, have more than double the percentage of participation rates in activity than those from the lowest level, from the lows below the poverty line. So 33% to 14.9%, um, you know, respectively. That's a big difference, right? So maybe we're thinking, you know, maybe, maybe it's potentially people having time to participate, right? Maybe if you're below the poverty line, maybe you don't even have, you know, time to, 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 to spare to, to, to exercise an activity. Um, we'll get into some other factors that may be involved here too. We see other trends as well for high school, uh, for education level, where um, individuals with a college or some college um, are almost three times more likely to participate in activity um, or, or, or meet, their, meet their guidelines for physical activity compared to those with uh, no high school diploma, right? So there, there may be social environmental barriers that impact the ability for patients to implement any guidance for. So even if patients do receive some guidance, right, there, there are other factors at play here, right? So again, it's not just necessarily, right, self-determinism. It's not necessarily just telling people to do things. We gotta, be, we gotta be cognizant of these other potential barriers. And then um, access, right? Access to facilities is a big thing, right? So if you move from a community with immediate household 
of $25,000 a year, so a relatively poor community, um, to one with a $75,000 a year um, median income. We see wholesale improvements in the presence of fitness facilities, sports clubs, dance facilities, and public golf, golf courses. And I can speak to this myself because I grew up in more of one of these communities here as a kid, like just what we had available to us in our community was a lot different than friends and, and family members of mine in more affluent areas, right? So just more resources in wealthier areas. However, even if those facilities are present in a patient's community, their income may place significant constraints and may make those things inaccessible, right? So even if they're there, if someone's not making a lot of money and don't have the resources or the the, the income to, to, you know, to afford access to a sports facility or a fitness facility or sports club, right, like that, even if it's there, they may not be, even be able to access it. And safe, well-maintained public, right? Free access recreational spaces. These are parks, beaches, national parks, right? They might not be, they're not, they're not necessarily, you know, available to everyone either. About one in five homes um, in America are within a half a mile of a park. Same is true for a fitness center, or recreational center. So like these things aren't evenly distributed. Some cities have done a much better job. I think Chicago has actually done a pretty good job um, with our parks district plan. But this is a big issue, right? Access, affordability, and then you factor in geographical constraints, seasonal weather. In the Midwest states, when we get in the northern Midwest states, we get into winter, it's too cold to be outside. So if you don't have the ability to afford an indoor facility for fitness, once the winter rolls around, you might be kind of stuck, right? Um, and then certain climates in the south in the summer when it's too hot to get outside. Uh, that's where we, if you guys remember that map of physical activity, that's where we see some of those really dark blue regions where people are less active on those polar opposites. And there's probably some environmental factors at play there too. Um, and this also, of course, translates to the ability to purchase equipment. So again, we often assume these things, people, all right, like go, you know, we'll just go do this. Well, you know, go, go exercise go be active. Well, if you don't have the means to do that, it's not going to be as, as simple as I think people realize. And then if you look at um, schools, right? Only six states in the United States require physical education in every grade. That's a big problem. Nearly one third of high school students play a video or computer games for three or more hours on an average school day. And that's probably through the roof now in the concert of the COVID pandemic, right? We're seeing more and more screen time, less and less play time for kids. And why this is really important to be mindful of, right? So peer groups, when we're in adolescence, we tend to organize ourselves around participation in physical activity and other health behaviors, right? Where kids tend to be exclusionary, um, and we also typically gravitate to people with shared interests. What can be a challenge here is that groups typically, um, well, the research has supported that um, they they tend to they tend to reflect the exercise habits of the least fit friend in that peer group. Right, so you know we organize ourselves according to you know you know um, interests towards activity, and then within those groups, it tends to look more similar to our individual who is the least active, right? So that can have major ramifications because your activity rates in childhood are associated with your activity rates in adulthood, and if we're not giving kids that in schools, maybe they're never getting it. Right? If they're never getting those habits, right, and maybe there's no habits at home either, and there's no space, we're setting people up for, for failure. right? So again, think broadly about these issues. These social determinants of health matter too. Now again, we're looking again at, at economy. right? So again, going back to there's bigger factors at play here. When we look at the 1960s, about half the U.S. workforce was physically active. 
you know, where I'm from in Pennsylvania, people worked in factories, they worked in, in mills and mines and stuff like that. Those kind of dried up by about the 80s. Um, we saw more sedentary jobs, more office jobs. And now sedentary jobs have increased by 83% to where currently physically active jobs, which were once 50% of our workforce, make up less than 20%. And again, if you don't have facilities, if you haven't developed habits, we've removed the opportunity for people to get some activity throughout the day through work. Well, we necessarily haven't replaced that. We haven't balanced that equation in certain communities. So again, I'm hoping we gain from this unit a better appreciation for the barriers that may be at play here. There's broader things involved than just people choosing to be active. Do they even have the opportunity to be active? And um, in the next section, we'll talk about, well, how do, where do we go from here? How do we address this?